understand. You may be seated. I got to do this. All of God's people said, Amen. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Let me stand by faith. What a marvelous thought. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to that passage we read just a few moments ago in Exodus chapter 6. We're moving toward the end. I think probably some are very happy about that, of the covenant in the land. We have some very important practical application to make today in relation to Christian marriage. You say, how in the world does the covenant of the land relate to Christian marriage? Well, you'll see in a moment. Some very important principles, as a matter of fact, that are set out in that particular covenant that likewise apply to a covenant made between a man and a woman in the sight of God. The covenant of the land, part 11. Now, so far, we've learned 27 specific things that relate to the covenant of the land. I'll not review them as I did last week. But last week, we began our study on one of the three reasons that God cast the people out of the land, even though he promised to bring them back. The specific sins for which he cast them out were threefold. Stubbornness, being stiff-necked, and for the rebellion against God and his word. We look very specifically at rebellion, the point of internal stubbornness where it breaks through the surface and the activity that comes out of that seeks to throw authority out of its place. It's the challenge to power. Rebellion doesn't limit itself to the individual. Rebellion always seeks followers. And we saw that there are practical consequences for rebellion. God still offers mercy even for the rebellious. God's design is to break the intergenerational cycle of rebellion. Rebellious leaders produce a rebellious people. Rebellious re rebellion results in rebels following bad advice to their own destruction. Rebellion produces lies and law-breaking. If you flee from rebellion, God gives you understanding. Rebellion, like all sin, begins in the heart. Rebellion or submission is a choice for which we are held accountable. Failure to preach, believe, and obey the truth is rebellion. Rebellion results in spiritual blindness, and God gives multiple warnings to the rebellious concerning what will happen to them. That summarizes two weeks of preaching right there. Most important, we asked the question last week, and this is where we closed. Why does God hate when his people are stubborn, stiff-necked, and rebellious? Why does God hate it so much? God gave the answer to that question to Saul when Saul failed to kill all the Amalekites and save the best of their cattle and sheep. Saul was a hypocrite. He pretended that he had fulfilled what God had commanded, but he had not. Saul was what I like to call a 99 percenter. Saul always did the will of God, almost. Saul obeyed God 100 percent, except. Folks, you see what happened to Saul. God expects us to be obedient to his word, to that which he has made clear in our lives. And Samuel said to Saul, for rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Serious consequences, because God looks at rebellion the same way he looks at witchcraft. God looks at stubbornness the same way he looks at moral impurity, that's iniquity, and idolatry. How does God look at witchcraft? I think you know the answer. How does God look at moral impurity? I think you know the answer. How does God look at idolatry? I think you know the answer. God says rebellion and stubbornness are like those sins. And I think that helps us to understand why repentance is the key to the covenant of the land. God insists on national repentance and confession of sin before he grants his blessings and his promises and we must not become proud because we also within the church and sometimes the church as an individual local church and sometimes it seems like the church as a whole is being stubborn and rebellious and stiff-necked as we look around at the disobedience of God's people will endure the chastening if that happens. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, where are all the partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits 
and live. That's the opposite of rebellion. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Rebellion never leads to holiness. Submission and subjection does. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous nevertheless. Afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. God says, time to do your exercises. I can remember the pain involved in running and in wrestling. Those are my two sports. Oh, it was agony, but the coach made us do it. He knew that we could never win. We would never be victors unless we went through the suffering. No chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And then he gives you the athletic illustration. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Let it be healed. And that's what God said to Israel, come, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. And that brings us to our five lessons for today. Lesson number one. How God deals with Israel as an elect group of people gives visible illustration of how God deals with us as elect individuals. God gave them to us as an example so that we will learn how he will deal with us individually. He deals with us that way because he loves us, because he wants us to be in fellowship with him. Romans 11, beginning in verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they, that is Israel, are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Now you should be thankful for that. We apply that to us and to our salvation. But he's talking in the context of God's call to Israel as a nation. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He still is going to keep his promises to them. If he does not keep his promises to them, how can you expect him to keep his promises to you? That would be wishful thinking. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Lesson number two. And notice this very well. Lesson number two. God, God is the one who sovereignly, and that's very important, God is the one who sovereignly works repentance in the heart of man in his time. God is the one who sovereignly works repentance in the heart of man in his time. Some very important key things that I emphasized in that little sentence I just gave to you. We're dealing here with the doctrine of election and predestination in application. The doctrine of election and predestination applied in the sphere of time and space. Predestination and election always have practical application both to history and in history. Those doctrines are not merely theoretical theology. No, predestination and election make an impact with world-shattering human intersections. We've seen that, like with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. With political ramifications. We see how theology and how predestinating providence brought Bloody Mary to the throne and raised up John Knox. We see how theology and the doctrines of election and predestination produce culture-changing events 
Think about the Great Awakening. Think about the Wesley revivals in England. Think about the moving sweep of the Holy Spirit across the South during the Civil War. Culture changing events. Election and predestination guarantee the sweeping movements of the Holy Spirit that change the course of history. And God is the one who sovereignly works repentance in the heart of man in his time. Those things didn't happen all at once. They didn't happen by accident. Within the sphere of God laying out history and doing it in such a way that it would ultimately bring him the greatest amount of glory, God moved at specific times in specific locations among specific people and we see he's doing that here in the book of Exodus. 400 years they have been in Egypt. God saw them getting softer and softer and softer and more and more amalgamated into their culture and more and more involved in the compromise with the gods of Egypt and God gave them a little pressure to see if that would turn their hearts and Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph was God late in providing for his people was God's purposes concerning election and predestination and promises was it behind schedule or did God at a precise moment in history raise up a man by the name of Moses exactly opposite of the Pharaoh who brought God's people into bondage was it by accident or was it by divine appointment that God caused their paths to intersect? Was there a clash and a change in culture? Was there a change in political history in Egypt? When we're dealing with election and predestination and dealing with the issue of repentance and God used that time in the cauldron of the turmoil of Egypt to deliver a people unto himself. Dear people, it's given to us for a lesson. We are a Christian group of people who have become softer and more complacent and more involved in compromise with the world we are a people who have begun to be blind to spiritual things. A people who no longer stands up and is counted for what is right and righteous. What happens over a period, in our case, of a little over 200 years, in the case of Israel, 400 years, what happens when God's people no longer represent him, no longer make an impact on their world, no longer have an intersection with their culture that challenges the culture to Christ. You see what happened in Egypt. God did deliver them because he had made promises to them. But they went through some suffering first. There were a lot of mothers who lost their babies thrown to the crocodiles in the Nile. There are a lot of men who died under slave labor building the monuments of Egypt. There are a lot of men whose bodies were bruised and broken and bleeding before God stepped in and said, Now will I show you what I will do unto Pharaoh. God sovereignly works repentance in the heart of man in his time. And God uses his people to be his instruments in doing it. And God moves his hand at the prayers of his people.
This is one of the reasons that God has commanded us, not requested, God has commanded us in 1 Timothy chapter 2 to make intercessory prayer our number one priority. Did you know that? Intercessory prayer is to be our number one priority. Listen to this. 1 Timothy 2.1 I exhort therefore that what are the next three words? I exhort therefore that first of all does that sound like a priority? I exhort therefore that first of all supplications prayers intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority that we might lead quiet and peaceable life and God, all godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior you know there are several things in scripture that we are told are acceptable to God I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that's open manifestation that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God God has not called us to put our light under a bushel God has called us to be like the city set on the hill, known and seen of all men, unashamed and unafraid, because we bear the light of Christ. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now let me tie it in with marriage, as I said I would a moment ago. This is why it is so important for husbands and wives to be in spiritual harmony and why they must pray together not only for themselves and for their children but pray that they might be instruments that God uses to make his sovereign impact on the world remember what I said a moment ago God uses people he didn't have to. He could have done everything with angels and just sort of munched us around here like, you know, pawns on the board. Having the angels move this group over here and having the angels take this guy and put him over here. Having the angels kill this guy here. He didn't do that. He could have done it with his own hand. He didn't do that. God in his wisdom and in his sovereignty uses people. If you are one of his, that means he has a job for you to do. God wants to take you and use you for his glory. Do you know what God has called you to do? Have you spent any time in prayer and in the study of his word to know exactly how he would have you to be used, where he has placed you now? Don't think pie in the sky ten years from now, sweet by and by kind of stuff. Think, I'm here now. What does God want me to do now? How am I going to be his witness now? Where I am, what I am, doing what I'm doing, growing in the word of God. How can he use me? Not tomorrow. I may not be here tomorrow. How can he use me today? Do you make the conscious, volitional choice to say this day belongs to Jesus Christ I will serve him by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in obedience to his word walking by faith I will serve him oh dear ones the joy that comes from making that commitment and sticking to it regardless of whatever opposition you face it's worth eternal rewards Husbands and wives must pray together 
to be the instruments that God uses to make his sovereign impact on the world. There are six specific commands in one verse on that subject. Six specific, I wish we had time to develop each one of these, maybe at some point when I'm going through 1 Peter, but listen to what it says. This is about prayer between husbands and wives and the relationship that they must have with one another so that their prayers will be effective. Listen to it. 1 Peter 3, 7. Likewise, ye husbands, number one, dwell with them. Sit down. Hold tight. Don't be rattled out. Don't walk off in a huff. Don't be mad because the wife will make you mad. And every husband knows that. And every <laughs> wife knows that the husband makes her mad too. Dwell with them. Two, according to knowledge. I wish we had time to develop that one. Husbands, you've got to know your wife. Really know her. Study her. Understand how God made her. Because you're the man that God brought into her life to fulfill her needs and to make her the way that Christ is making the church. Does our Lord Jesus know us intimately? Does he know what's wrong with us? Does he know how to gently change and mold and shape us into his image so that we reflect him? The godly husband is working in the life of his wife because he knows her well to help her become like Christ. Number three, giving honor unto the wife. You know, sometimes that's hard. This past week I had a young man call me I haven't seen him in a very, very long time, but a young man sort of called me out of the blue. And uh, he has a very difficult wife. Almost immediately after they got married, she began throwing things at him, hitting on him with things, um, you know, kicking him, biting him. I mean, he never expected it. She would yell and scream at him. She would demand her way. She would tell him that if you don't do what I want now, I'm leaving. You know what it says here? Likewise, ye husbands, giving honor unto the wife. This young man told me of a situation. In fact, it's occurred apparently many times. I've not been there, not seen it. Don't know her that well. But uh, where she will be... Uh, talking with some friends, they'll be in a group, and um, he will need to communicate with her about one of the children, and he'll walk up and she'll be talking to two or three friends, and he'll stand there patiently, sometimes for three, four minutes, while she ignores him. And finally, her friends will get embarrassed and they'll say, so-and-so, I think your husband wants to talk to you. And then, so she can impress her friend, she say, Oh, I didn't see you there. And what is it that you want? Green, 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 smile, smile, smile. He was in distress. This has gone on for years and years and years. But he honors his wife. He never says anything bad about her to any of their friends, to anyone else. Finally, in desperation, he came to me for pastoral counsel. Husbands giving honor unto the wife. Number four, as unto the weaker vessel, it doesn't seem like that in some cases, does it? As unto the weaker vessel. God made the husband to be, as the old song said, a tower of strength. The husband is to be there for her all the time. 
every time. Her place of refuge, just like Christ, is our place of refuge. In her time of need, in her time of distress. She's the weaker vessel. You might have a cast iron spittoon. You might have a Ming vase. Which of those is the weaker vessel? Now the cast iron spittoon is very, very utilitarian. And you can beat it up and kick it around and, you know, doesn't hurt it at all. But you can't do that with a Ming vase. She's the weaker vessel. You protect her. You care for her. You treasure her. You put her in the place of honor. Do you know there's a reason for all of this? Because we get to number five. As being heirs together of the grace of life. The husband and wife have been made co-heirs of the grace of life. We think of that primarily in terms of children and certainly that does apply. The grace of life that God gives to a husband and a wife as he brings this helpless new baby into the world. And I'm delighted with the, the new one. I've only seen pictures of him so far, but I'm delighted with this new little one that God has given to one of my sons and his wife. And I'm delighted that another one of my sons and his wife were expecting one in January and another one of my sons and his wife were expecting one in February. It's exciting. Heirs together of the grace of life. But you know, it goes farther than that because for a Christian husband and a Christian wife, they are heirs together of the grace of eternal life. And they are to be manifesting in their marriage relationship what this eternal life is like. Our life with Christ, our relationship with our heavenly bridegroom, For he, as represented by the husband, shows the grace and the kindness and the patience and the long-suffering, the compassion, the strength, the protection that is necessary for the weaker vessel, his bride, the church, and where the church responds in loving submission to the heavenly bridegroom and seeks to bring him joy and rejoicing because she loves him. Dear people, that's a beautiful picture and here's the reason, number six. That your prayers be not hindered. It's a taken as a given that the husband and the wife will pray together because God has made them a visible unit on earth to teach His truth. And God has given a very special and very powerful union in prayer between a husband and a wife. Perhaps part of the reason that the church has lost her impact today. Perhaps part of the reason that we no longer have the moving of the Holy Spirit of God in our land is because Christian husbands and Christian wives have forgotten that they must be in that relationship with Christ but with their spouse as they communicate with Christ. That your prayers be not hindered. Now remember, I haven't lost my train of thought here. 
We're still talking about God who is the one who sovereignly works repentance in the heart of man in his time. But God uses people as his instruments and God moves his hand in answer to the prayers of his people and one of the most powerful and one of the most important contexts for prayer is the prayer between the husband and the wife. It's in that context in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7 which we just read the context of the responsibility of the wives to be in submission and obedience to their own husbands and the husbands to reflect the love of Christ to their wives. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, hey, that means that you've got some non-Christian husbands. Isn't that interesting? That's in this context. That if any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. That's the manner of life. That's what that word conversation, not by the, the babbling and jabbering of the wife where she harasses them all day long. That's not what it's talking about. While they behold your chaste conversation, that is your manner of life, coupled with fear. God expects wives to be morally pure. He expects that of husbands too. The modest morally pure, godly wife, whose adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of plaiting the hair and wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. That's not what makes you beautiful, ladies and girls. Now, he's not saying you can't wear gold or jewels or fix your hair because if that were the case, he'd be telling you you couldn't wear clothes either. That is obviously not the point of this passage. But that should not be the point of your beauty. He tells you what should be the point of the beauty. Verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. The most beautiful ornament is not the gold necklace, is not the diamond earrings. The beautiful ornament, the most beautiful in the sight of God, is the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. That's the word for panic. Husbands, we must deal gently with wives when they tend to panic. You are the rock, you're the cornerstone, you're the strength around which they bounce off all different directions. I know when Judy and I were married, we had what we called rule number one. I learned this early on in marriage <laughs> because there was always the fear, the panic, wanting to bounce this way or that way. And so we developed rule number one. And whenever Judy would begin to get tense about something, I'd say rule number one. I didn't have to say anything else. Rule number one. Rule number one was don't panic. <laughs> don't panic. And things would settle down. Oh, we had some other rules too. Maybe I'll share those with you as time goes by. I could say rule two and we knew exactly what that meant. Or rule three, we knew exactly what that meant. But rule number one was don't panic. The walk of faith and having the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit is learning not to be afraid with any amazement. Paul agrees with Peter. He puts it this way. And of course, both were inspired by the Spirit of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, whether husbands and wives admit it. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Husbands, are you spending time reading the word of God to your wives? That's what cleanses and purifies. Do you spend time reading the scripture together? Do you spend time praying together? This is what will build your home. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. How does Jesus take care of you? You see, we're members of his body. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, men, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife, see that she reverence her husband. Remember what Peter told us about Sarah and Abraham? She called him Lord. She reverenced her husband. Now, I hope you see the connection with what we've just been talking about. If the wife is rebellion or in rebellion, she reflects what happened to Israel in the Old Testament. We've been talking about rebellion and submission and obedience. With the husband in submission to Christ and the wife in submission to her own husband, the children see the visible picture of what it means to yield themselves to the will of God. To have a happy marriage, all of us need to repent from rebellion and to reflect the submission and obedience that God intended if we want to have his blessing. That's exactly the same principle like Israel in the Old Testament must repent as a nation if they want to receive God's national blessing. God gives us some of these major overarching principles that suddenly have gigantic cords down to every area of life and every part of God's program. The principle is the same, it's merely a different application of precisely the same divine principle. Our time is up, we haven't even gotten to lesson three yet. I'll tell you what the lesson is. Lesson number three is repentance is not a normal human response when we're confronted with our sin. It's not a normal human response. It's not like, oh, I just didn't realize it. Boy, I'm sure glad you pointed it out. I will repent right now. That is not the normal human response when we're confronted with our sins. Repentance is not even a normal human response when we are suffering because of sin. We usually don't want to make the connection between our suffering and our sin. In any case, we want to blame someone else. And I have some great illustrations of that. The Lord willing, we'll try to finish it next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its practical application. We learn principles from what happened to Israel in the Old Testament and see how you take those same principles and bring it down to where we live today. Not 14 BC, 1400 B.C., but now more than 2,000 years after the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, you're still the same God. You still function in the same way. You still have the same divine principles for us. You still have the same lessons to teach us. You give us physical illustrations through national Israel. And now you apply them to us individually. You help us to understand what our relationship should be with you. 
How it should apply to the way we walk day by day. How we have our marriages. How we react in our job situations. How we act perhaps in our school situations. Whatever area of life in our interactions with other people, we are to be washed and cleansed with the water of your word so that we might reflect Jesus Christ to all those around us. An encouragement to other believers, perhaps a challenge to those who have not trusted in Christ. An example to the world around us, men and women, boys and girls who have made a commitment to Christ, even if it costs our life. Father, it's your word that's important, not what this preacher says. I pray that you will take the truth of your word this day and apply it to each one of our hearts so that Jesus Christ would be made manifest in our lives that as those doctrines of election and predestination intersect with human life in our sphere, it would have earth-shattering results that bring glory to Jesus Christ. For we pray these things in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 517, 517, I will sing of my redeemer.